this, these are your notes on behavior. Behavior is kind of a hodgepodge of um, pieces. Uh, part of it's chapter 39, part of it's chapter 38, part of it's chapter 51. Um, so let's start talking about plant behavior. We're really going to talk about plant and animals. So plant behavior, um, many plants seem to undergo a daily cycle, although you don't probably notice this with your eyes, they're actually undergoing kind of a daily um, cycle of things just like we undergo a cycle. Um, transpiration, if you remember this from Bio 1, is the evaporation of water from the leaves of plants. We actually do a transpiration lab during um, our ecology unit. Um, some cycles seem to be in response to light levels, temperature, and relative humidity that accompany a 24-hour cycle of day and night. So kind of like we have a circadian rhythm, they have something similar. We can use artificial conditions to manipulate these variables, but often these conditions continue to oscillate with the 24-hour frequency. Um, for example, you can even manipulate these, but you'll still see that opening and closing of the stomata um, still open and close according to a normal 24-hour cycle. Um, and they also produce enzymes according to our normal um, cycle. Um, you probably don't notice these tiny differences, but this is a plant at noon versus at uh, midnight, but you don't really notice because it's a very subtle change. Um, circadian rhythms are cycles with a frequency of about 24 hours and are not directly controlled by any known environmental factor, but they seem to cycle about 24 hours. Um, recall that sleep and wake is a human circadian rhythm. Research supports the idea that genes seem to control the circadian rhythms and not the environmental factors. Because of this, you can manipulate, and we said here, you can manipulate these, you can use artificial conditions, but it doesn't seem to affect them. It seems to be more of a uh, genetic, not an environmental um, factor. Daily signals from the environment can set the circadian clock to a period of precisely 24 hours. So we can use those artificial conditions to perfect that or get it more, um, more on target. Um, tropism, phototropism, we talked a little bit about this um, when we did the uh, worksheet on uh, plant hormones. Uh, any growth in response that results any growth response that results in the plant's organs moving toward or away from a stimuli. Um, phototropism is the one we looked at, where photo means light and tropism means moving or growing toward. So this is where the shoot grows towards the light, um, or it could actually grow away from it, um, positive versus negative. The response results from a differential growth of cells on the opposite side of the shoot. Cells on the darker side elongate faster than the cells on the brighter side. We talked about this as well. So you notice in this picture that these over here are going to be elongated, um, and that's caused by uh, toxin, okay? Um, and it's going to cause that shoot to bend. So this is actually the experiment you looked at in that worksheet. Environmental stimuli that plants use most often to detect the time of the year is the photo period. That's the relative length of um, the day and the night. Photoperiodism is a psychological response to the photoperiod, such as flowering. You'll notice um, flowers bloom at certain times of the year, uh, repeatedly every year. Um, read chapter 38.1 quickly on um, pollination, just kind of reminding yourself of what happens with pollination. And in this space, write some. Um, behavioral ecology is the study of ecological and evolutionary basis for animal behavior. Um, Nico Timbergen suggested that understanding behavior requires answering the following question. What stimulus elicits the behavior and what psychological mechanisms mediate the response? How does the animal's experience during growth and development influence the response? How does the behavior aid survival and reproduction? And what is the behavior's evolutionary history? So let's talk about some behavioral patterns that scientists have noted. Six action patterns are the sequence of unlearned acts directly linked to a simple stimulus. So a couple of things here, unlearned, and they're linked to a simple stimulus. They trigger the behavior, uh, trigger for the behavior is an external cue called a sign stimulus. And so in this is the example of the male stickleback fish. 
Um, in this example, uh, it doesn't matter what model you give uh, these pickleback. They are going to respond to the dark underside. They do not respond to a light underside. It just does not matter what um, the shape of them is. It's just the color. And so they're responding to that sign, that dark, dark red belly. Um, migration is another um, animal behavior. Um, regular long distance change in location. Um, some migrating animals track the position relative to the sun and adjust for changes in the sun's position by means of the circadian clock. Homing pigeons place a magnet on their heads and it prevents them from returning to the roost. What does that suggest to you? You should probably think somewhere along the lines of um, the magnetic field um, on Earth and that might be influencing their ability to find home. Um, behavioral rhythms, we talked about circadian rhythms, the daily cycle. Um, not all biological rhythms are linked to light and dark. Example, a filler crab's claw waving courtship is linked to timing of new and full moon. Circannual rhythms are behavioral rhythms linked, linked to yearly cycle of the season. Um, animals can communicate through visual, chemical, tactile, or auditory. The form of communication is often closely related to the animal's lifestyle and the environment. For example, nocturnal animals don't usually use visual displays because visuals would be hard in the dark, so they would use something like um, smell or uh, sound. Pheromones are actually chemicals that are emitted um, that produce an odor um, that is a signal um, to others of their same species. Often that's actually involved in reproductive behavior. Um, this is kind of cool. Um, bees do something called a waggle dance. Um, they perform this when food is um, distant. Um, and they will do this little dance they do. And that actually indicates the direction and the angle so that others can find um, the same food source. Pretty bizarre and weird. Um, I think there's actually a Magic School Bus episode on bees. And I think they do. I don't think they go full into the waggle dance, but I think they get into the idea that um, that's how they communicate is through their movement to alert others. Um, let's talk a little about um, how animals learn. For many behaviors, everyone in the population exhibits the same behavior, known as innate behavior because it is biologically fixed. So innate behaviors are going to be biologically fixed. Um, kind of think about when we just did the immune system. Um, innate immune system is the one that is the first responder. It's the quick one. Um, it's the one that everyone just kind of, you're biologically, you have it already. You don't have, to, it's not something that is um, formed later on. So it's the same idea here. Researchers study how social and physical environments influence behavior by doing cross fostering and twin studies. Um, so this is an example here where they did a cross fostering um, Example, you have California mice are fostered by the white-footed, um, and the aggression towards the intruder was um, not reduced, uh, was reduced. The aggression in a neutral situation was no different. Um, paternal behavior was reduced. But when you, okay, so you'll notice here, it says the comparison is um, when they're raised by parents of their own. And so when they're raised by different, there are actually some things that um, will have a difference. Um, and this tells um, scientists a lot of things about um, if the behavior tends to be more of a genetic um, for the species or if it tends to be more of a learned behavior. Um, Learning is a modification of behavior based on specific experiences. Um, imprinting is the formation of a specific stage in life of a long-lasting behavioral response to a particular individual object. Um, this can both be innate or can be learned. The tendency to respond is innate, but the imprinting stimulus is provided by an outside world. Um, the sensitive period is basically the critical period, and that's the limited amount of time you have when imprinting can occur. This is kind of an interesting um, one here, I think I got a picture here. Where is that? So in the top picture here, um, these young Galag geese actually imprinted on um, this ethologist's 
um, Conrad Lorenz uh, and he was able to show that basically they thought he was their parent and <laughs> they followed him around and did what he did. Um, the second one at the bottom, a pilot wearing a crane suit was flying an ultra light plane that acts as a surrogate parent to direct the migration of whooping cranes. <laughs> so um, that imprinting is there's kind of a critical period usually early in life um, that you can get an organism to imprint on, um, on you, on a different species. Uh, oops. Spatial learning, the establishment of memory that reflects the environment's spatial structure. So structure. This one's kind of interesting. So you have a bee here, and this is their nest, and it's surrounded by these um, pine cone trees. Um, and then what we found is that if um, they did an experiment that if they left the nest but moved the trees, the bees would actually go back to the, the center of these trees and not to the nest because they associated their nest with the spatial arrangement of these trees, which is kind of cool. Um, learning often involves making associations between experiences. Associative learning is the ability to associate one environmental feature with another. Uh, classical conditioning versus operant conditioning. Uh, an arbitrary stimulus becomes associated with a particular outcome. This is where Braden did his PowerPoint on Pavlov's dog. Um, so I hope you remember that. He, um, gave the dog treats and rang a bell, gave the dog treats and rang a bell, and then at some point he rang the bell and the dog automatically began salivating because he associated the bell with the um, food. Um, and you can actually do some, I've heard some interesting things recently about how you can do some reverse of this, um, where you, uh, like, if you give a dog treats and give them dog treats and make them happy, but then um, you Get, throw them a treat and then you shake this um, like a really loud shaking noise. Um, you can actually purchase this kit somewhere for dogs. <laughs> and you shake it and then you withdraw the treat. And so they start to associate the shaking noise with bad because they're not getting the treat. And so then if they're biting or um, uh, they're playing rough, or they're doing something you don't want them to do, um, if you shake that, they will associate that with bad and they will stop doing it. I don't know. I thought that was kind of interesting. I didn't know that uh, it existed. Operant conditioning is a trial and error learning when an animal first learns to associate one of its behaviors with reward or punishment and then tends to repeat or avoid the um, behavior. Studies reveal that animals can learn to link many pairs of features in their environment, but not all. Um, an example, pigeons can learn to associate danger with sound, but not color. Associations of animals can uh, readily form, typically reflect relationships likely to occur in nature. And those unlikely to form are those relationships unlikely to be of collective advantage in nature. Cognition is a process of knowing that involves awareness, reasoning, recollection, and judgment. Um, it's the most complex form of learning. Um, one thought that only primates and certain marine ant mammals can have this high level of processing, but now studies are showing that's not true. Um, here is an example with a maze. Um, it's a color maze. Um, the bees are trained um, in this color maze. Um, they're rewarded for choosing the same color. So they go through the blue, and then they go through the blue again, and then they're rewarded. If they go through the yellow, they're not going to be rewarded. So they're trained this. And then they're tested using this pattern maze. Um, and most bees, if they were trained with the color maze, they will actually do the pattern maze. So they notice this first pattern and then they'll choose the door to um, the same pattern. Um, problem solving is cog as, uh, cognitive activity of devising a method to proceed from one state to another in the face of real or apparent obstacles. We all know what problem solving is for every day. Um, problem solving is highly developed in some mammals, especially primates and dolphins. Dolphins are very smart. Um, social learning is learning through observing um, forms the root of a culture. And here are some um, young chimpanzees learning to crack oil palm nuts by observing and experiencing from the elders. Um, here is an example of a vervet monkey learning to correct um, the correct use of alarm calls. Upon seeing the python, the vervet monkeys give a distinct snake alarm, um, and the members of the group stand upright and they look down. Um, natural selection refines behaviors that are about survival and reproduction because, again, those, those behaviors are going to survive better, reproduce, and pass that on to their offspring. 
Um, every single thing at the evolution of a foraging behavior, this is um, is a food obtaining behavior. Fruit flies have a variation in a gene called the forager. They call it the foraging, which dictates the food search behavior. Larvae with this particular um, for rover gene, so they have a gene that's in a in this particular um, sequence. They travel further to find food than the larvae that have more what we call the sitter allele. Experiments have found that the enzyme encoded by the forager locust is more active in the larvae with the one form than in the larvae for the other. Um, that has properties typical of an enzyme in a signal transduction pathway. So again, think about what we've learned about that signal response transduction. In a high density population, which allele would be an advantage? Well, yes, obviously the rover because they're more dense, so they're going to have to go further for food. Um, and about in low density populations, it's going to be the sitter because they're not wasting energy. They're letting um, the food kind of come to them. They're not having to go as far. Um, so what does that mean? In high density populations, they're probably going to have more like this. In low density, and more like this because that's what's favored in that environment. Um, and again, um, we have um, a graph here. The evolution of the foraging behavior by the laboratory, um, and you'll notice that um, in the high density population, that gene is a little bit um, more prominent, and then in the um, team that it, and the, um, low density, it's a little less prominent. So don't go as far. Foraging behavior is a compromise between the benefits of nutrition and the cost of obtaining the food. It might be the energy expenditure or the risk of being eaten while you're out getting your food. Um, and this is kind of the same idea, the energy cost and benefits of foraging behavior. Experimental results indicate that dropping shells from a height of 5 meters results in breakage with the least amount of work. The actual drop height preferred by pros corresponds almost exactly to the height that minimizes total flight height. They're smart. Um, mating behaviors and mate choice play a major role in determining reproductive success. Um, these are mating systems. You're probably somewhat familiar with these. Um, monogamous is where we'll start because that's what we're most familiar with. One male with one female. Um, promiscuous, no strong bond. There are animals that are very promiscuous. And then there's polygamous, an individual of one sex mates with several of the other. Um, and there's two different types. You might end up with a single male with many females or a single female with many males. You don't have to memorize those. Sexual dimorphism is the extent to which males and females differ in their appearance. Um, varies with the type of mating system. In monogamous mating systems, the males and females tend to not differ very much. Um, in polygamous, um, males tend to be more showy. Um, why would that be? In polyandrous, uh, females tend to be more showy. Why? Because they have to attract the mate, and then they have to attract the mate. Um, and there's just some examples. Um, very similar in appearance, uh, very different. The males are very, very um, ornamented here. Um, and then in this case, the female is going to be more ornamented. Um, parental care may have to do um, uh, may have to do with how sure a species is of paternity. The external fertilization increases the certainty of um, increases the certainty of paternity. Among fishes and amphibians, parental care occurs in only seven percent of species with internal fertilization, and sixty nine percent of species with external. Um, and so external means the male has to actually fertilize on the outside, so then you're more sure that they're the, the father. Um, sexual selection is a form of natural selection in which differences in reproductive success among individuals are a consequence of differences in mating success. The degree of sexual dimorphism within a species results from the sexual selection process. We've talked about that before. Mate preference for females may play a central role in the evolution of male behavior and anatomy through intersexual selection. Mate choice may be influenced by imprinting. Zebra finches in which females raised by ornamented male parents preferred ornamental males as their own mates. There's a picture of this one here. Oh, that, sorry, that one's on it. Good morning, Washington.
All right, sorry about that. So this shows that basically if the male was really ornamented, the female had a mate preference for ornamented uh, males. I don't know if you've ever heard this in humans, but sometimes people say that you look for somebody that's similar to your father. I think that's kind of creepy, but whatever. Um, mate choice copying individuals in a population copy the mate choice of others. It's a form of social learning. Um, a female that mates with males that are attractive to other females increases the probability that her male offspring will also be attractive and have high reproductive success. And that's just an example of that. Um, male will, males will compete for mates. Um, that also reduces variation among the males, so it makes them more similar to each other. Such competition may involve agnostic behavior, a ritualized contest that determines which competitor gains access to a resource, food, or mate. There you go. There's some agnostic behavior. Um, game theory evaluates alternative strategies in situations where the outcome depends on the strategies of all the individuals involved. Inside blotched lizards, the mating success of one lizard type is influenced by the relative abundance of the other types, which causes fluctuations in the population. And that's the coloration here. Um, whatever they're mating for at that time is going to influence future generations, so it can fluctuate in the population. And fruit flies, the fruit gene controls the entire courtship ritual. This particular gene mutated in an inactive form. Males do not court um, or mate with females. Um, when females are genetically manipulated to express this gene, they court other females. Um, the fruit is the master regular gene that directs the expression activity of many other genes with error functions. Genes that are controlled by the fruit gene bring about sex specific development in the fruit fly nervous system. That's kind of a cool thing there to think about. Um, you don't have to read the case study. Um, altruism is a behavior that reduces an animal's individual fitness but increases the fitness of other individuals in the population. Um, so basically, they're doing something for the greater good, and you can read through those examples. Think about the queen bee, probably most familiar with that one. Inclusive fitness, the total effect of an individual has on has on the proliferating its genes by producing its own offspring and by providing aid that enables other close relatives to share many of those genes to produce offspring. And there's an example of that. And I'm going to stop now because I've got too long and you all are coming into class.